Infernax is frustrating, soul destroying, and at times I found myself shouting so loudly at the TV that I was worried my neighbours would call the doctor to take me away. And that sounds really negative, but I loved every darn minute of it. Infernax is a game that perfectly captures the spirit of classics that I grew up with. Things like Altered Beast, Golden Axe, Castlevania and Ghosts and Goblins to name a few. But rather than trying to be retro or disguise itself as a game of yesteryear, it acts more like a homage. And I'll explain that in more detail as this video rumbles on. Now, anyone who knows my channel knows that I'm always looking for the next great gaming experience. And I love finding out what makes games tick and explain what makes them special. And while I often critique and deep dive into titles that have been out for a while and say whether they're still special today, Infernax is more of a recent release, having come out in February 2022. But when I played it, I've got to say that this game blew me away and most definitely deserves to sit among some of the other classic titles that I've spoken about. So my friends, without any further ado, strap yourselves in because Infernax is most definitely something special. So this game came very highly recommended by a friend on my Discord, Wodnik. He said that it was the perfect game for my channel. Strong words indeed. Perfect game for my channel. But on the face of it, I have to admit, it did indeed look something pretty darn perfect. A retro styled ARPG 2D platformer that was made to look like a NES game set in a cursed kingdom sort of something like, I don't know, Castlevania. So many of the boxes that I look for in a game were ticked, but I've been here before. So many games try to look retro and they don't manage to quite pull it off. It leaves you wondering why they bothered. Did they just make it look retro for the sake of it kind of as a marketing ploy because, I don't know, Stardew Valley did well. And for every amazing 2D platformer like Hollow Knight and Celeste, there are scores more that I will never bother to feature on my channel because they just miss the mark in one way or another. So, to say the least, I was a little apprehensive. But then my good old friend Game Pass came to the rescue. There it was, free, not free because I pay for the subscription, but then I downloaded it without any hope of being wowed. More likely just a retro wannabe and well, at least it had zombies and the undead in it. But from my earlier declaration, you probably know that this most definitely wasn't the case. This game knocked my socks off. From the moment I picked up the controller, it just felt right. That's the best way I can describe it, right. What I quickly discovered is that this game is an amazing homage to the platformers of yesteryear and homage is important because it doesn't try to disguise itself as a game from another time, but instead it pays tribute. And I knew, even before I checked out the website of the developers, before writing this video, that this game was made with, with love, with passion, by people who remembered these sorts of games. When I did make my way to the website, my suspicions were confirmed. On the game's website, when talking about the team, it reads, Berserk Studio started about a decade ago and was founded by three people. Those three developers had left their previous studio after years of excelling in what they call cute toy related flash games for kids. Then they say the next logical step was to make brutal Viking related games. And that originally they wanted to make games for the consoles, but soon they realized that the world just doesn't work that way. They say that they wanted to make creative, challenging and polished games, but most of all, fun. Then they went on to say that they pride themselves in everything that they do and make sure that if there's something with the Berserk name on it, that it's worth your time. Then they go on to talk about the game. Now, first of all, they make a few jokes about the revolutionary system that was revolutionary back in 1988. Their joke, not mine. But more importantly, they go on to say that they tried to capture the essence of the games that left a mark on their childhoods. The ones that they say lit the spark that made us want to make games of our own. 
They also go on to say that the recreation of that experience that they had growing up, playing those obscure NES games, the kind of game that left you with a feeling of accomplishment once you beat it, several months after the initial purchase. And from what I read, it sounds to me like three devs who felt a bit creatively stifled and decided to go their own way. They said after making games for kids, they wanted to make what they wanted to make. It resonated with me. I, I think if we're honest, we have at times all felt pressure to make things for the audience rather than something that we're passionate about or that we don't have a voice in our own vocation. And that bit of honesty about the fact that first consoles were beyond them, although clearly not now as I'm playing Infernax on the Xbox Series X, is a transparency that is rare, and it's almost unheard of outside of the realms of indie devs. This passage alone that I read on the website exudes the passion that most AAA games, with their huge teams of devs in which voices get lost, can only dream of. Berserk Studios set out a powerful mission statement, and this my friends for me is what makes it special. The attention to detail, the carefully crafted homage to their inspiration materials, and the seeming passion behind the devs that made it. It's what I meant when I said that it feels right, cause you can kind of feel it. But what made this game so fun to play? Well, like I said, this game made me shout a lot at the screen, because at times it is unbelievably frustrating in a good way. Now, I remember games like Ghosts and Goblins at times, they made me want to rage quit, but it wasn't because they were bad, it was because I wanted to be better. Infernax is challenging more so than frustrating. What was frustrating was my failings, and rather than put me off, it made me want to level up my character, learn enemy moves, work out jump timings, and as my character grew in terms of skills and weapons, so did I. The learning curve of this game is hugely satisfying, and as the devs say, when you beat it, it leaves you feeling awesome. Now at times I became almost addicted to trying over and over again to beat the bosses or, or sections of dungeons that I went into, and if I felt underpowered I would grind my EXP points by exiting and entering the same section over and over again until I had enough points to level up, which sounds a bit like, I don't know, cheating. but. Rather than feel like a fraud, it felt like the kind of hacks that you discovered as ways to level up in games of that era. Now when you begin the game, you start off with the briefest of tutorials basically showing you jump and attack. You kill a couple of things, make a couple of jumps, and you are off. While it all starts off pretty sedate, you are soon presented with your first multiple choice option. A character approaches, and do you save them or do you slay them? The decision that you make in these sorts of moments have impact, either immediate or later. Now in this case, if you slay them, later on their loved one screams at you and throws you out from their house. If you choose to save them, they turn into a terrifying monster that, well, first time, wiped the floor with me. Now while I often feel loath to say that your choices matter, in this case it really felt like it seemed to, which in turn adds a bit of replayability because you can play through multiple times to see how different choices play out. It adds a huge amount of shelf life to this game. Also, to make the game more interesting, there was a day and night cycle that actually changed things. I won't go into too much detail not to ruin it, but some things included some characters that you need to complete quests appearing, some enemies getting stronger, or then there are different enemies. On top of all those features that made it feel right, it actually looked like a great 1980s platformer. Graphically, it was simple, but that's not negative. I could not imagine this game looking any other way any more polished and I think it would have weakened the final experience. Then there was the music, epic tunes pumped out through battles and areas that somehow felt instantly recognisable, even though I'd never heard them before. Oh, and by the way, when I say that this game is graphically simple, it does not mean it was not grotesque or beautiful to look at. A message at the start tells you that this game isn't for kids, and really? It's not. There are eye-popping monsters, demons with entrails, and so many ways to die. This game is most definitely not shy on the blood and guts. But for me, what's important, in terms of it being a great homage to 2D platformers of old, there are certain boxes that need ticking. Tight controls to make precision jumps? Check. Decent combat that felt tricky but satisfying to master? Check. A good variety of enemies whose moves you had to learn? Check and epic boss battles. Check, check, check. There were so many boss battles, even more if you followed the side quests. 
To give the game even more authenticity like a NES classic, the devs have actually added some cheat codes that you can put in when you enter the name of your character. And what that does is unlock a variety of secret characters to give you even more replayability and fun. Now, possibly the weakest element of the experience, but by no means really a negative, was the story. You get a cutscene at the start introducing the plot. A year ago, a curse arrived in the land. It's not the most complex of overall plots, basically foul monsters that are so foul they would mentally scar some children, hence it not being for kids, are everywhere and you have to go around, get stronger and rid the world of demons, which, I mean, that sounds a bit condescending, but the plot is simple, but engaging and I was totally invested like a platformer version of D&D. You don't need more than that. You know what you're doing and you know why you're doing it. And for me, the best parts of the story came through the side quests. You meet characters like a guard who used to be a farmer till his barn was taken over by demons and a wife whose husband seems possessed. But going back, many of the games back then did just really have simple plots if you just break it down. There is a joy in simplicity, ladies and gentlemen. For me, what made this game stand out is that it's made by fans of the genre, who were there and loved these early NES titles, and they wanted to share their passion for that genre with gamers today. And in my opinion, what I just said is the very reason indie games are in the limelight at the moment. They are made by gamers who remember what games used to be like before loot boxes and live service were ever a thing. They remember a time when games were pretty brutal. Because back then, games were hard. There was a lack of handholding. You died and it was pretty much back to the start for you. You lost all progress. Infernax gives you two options, classic or casual. In classic, if you die, you restart at your last save point. You lose all your gained EXP, all the keys that you found, the skills that you gained and the progress that you made. It's hard, it's annoying and it makes you want to get better. In the casual mode, the game gets easier, but personally, well, I couldn't. I wanted the full experience, so I went for classic. Tricky jumps and difficult bosses added more jeopardy. There was more to lose. Every time that I attacked an enemy, I felt the tension of pressure of having to get it right. Because when some of those buggers hit you, they hit hard. And safe to say, I died many, many times, but I kept going. The only real negative that I need to throw out there is that this game is pretty darn short. However, there is, like I've mentioned before, a lot of replayability options there, so it's kind of swings and roundabouts on that one. Maybe if you're umming and are in, pick it up on Game Pass or pick it up when it's on sale. The final thing I need to add to talk about this game is that there were some light Metroidvania elements. You could learn new skills like jumps or the ability to break down walls or access new areas. There were new weapons and armor upgrades that you could buy with coins dropped by slain enemies. You could learn spells such as heal or lightning strikes to make the sections easier. And while at the start your health, power and mana levels were weak, you could spend some EXP points on leveling up to become stronger. I enjoyed the progression of the game, the skills that made my life a little easier and new areas accessible. I enjoyed the game getting bigger and bigger. Being able to buy extra lives at least gave me another shot at a section in which I died. And then talking about enemies, the stronger my character got, the progression made the game get easier somewhat. But those tricky jumps still meant that one false step and like the games of old, it was back to the last save point. Brutal, soul destroying, challenging, and I loved it. So that for me is why it's special. A homage that pays tribute to the games of yesteryear made by people who clearly get these types of games. It doesn't try to rip anything off, it doesn't try to disguise itself, but it pays tribute. It's the understanding and passion for the genre that shines through and it means that this game stands out. It's made me want to revisit games like Symphony of the Night, which probably might give you an idea of what videos are coming down the line. So for any fans of 2D platformers and Metroidvanias, or just an older gamer like me who was there, this is one to check out. But maybe if you don't like old school graphics or something that's pretty brutal, well, think again, because this game is gonna challenge you. Let me know in the comments below any games that you think that I need to revisit or check out for the first time. But from me today, all it leaves me to say is thank you very much for watching, and this is Roy McCoy, out!